it's a hopeful movie actually because there's a lot of sinister events that end up becoming hopeful in the end <laughs> so and then i also wanted people to come out and just want to explore more of Lorca's work I'm Ben Davis, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Marcel de Zama has an immediately recognizable style as a visual artist, but his energy has far exceeded visual art. Born in Winnipeg, Canada in 1974, de Zama got his start with the Royal Art Lodge, a group that came together as students at the University of Manitoba in the mid-90s. Their collaborative working method, where one artist would start a work and others finish it, were called The Exquisite Corpse, a parlor game associated with the Surrealists. As Dezama developed his own independent practice moving to New York in 2004, he continued to explore the surreal in watercolor and ink. His work is replete with dancers and masked figures, whimsical animals, groovy monsters, human-plant hybrids, and grinning moons, all in an intricate but deliberately naive style. Dezama has permuted these offbeat interests into a variety of other media as well, from zines to dioramas to films. He's done album art for They Might Be Giants and Beck, made films starring Kim Gordon and Amy Sedaris, and created costumes for both a Bob Dylan music video and the New York City Ballet. Now, he's expanding his list of collaborations even further. New York's performance art biennial, Performa, is returning with a roster of artists commissioned to do new work in experimental performance of various types. Marcel Dezama's piece, titled To Live on the Moon for Lorca, is among the highlights promised by the 2023 program. In it, he fuses multiple threads of his practice, costume, dance, drawing, and film, and he also returns to his surrealist inspirations. Specifically, this work is Dezama's tribute to the life and work of Spanish surrealist poet Federico Garcia Lorca. It incorporates both Lorca's tragic life story and an obscure, unproduced, surrealist screenplay called A Trip to the Moon, which Lorca wrote while he was living in New York in 1929. It's fascinating material to dig into on many levels, and in the lead-up to the opening of the show at the Abrams Art Center, Dezama came into the Art Angle office to talk about his work and interests about Federico Garcia Lorca, and about what surrealism does and doesn't mean today. Marcel Zama, thank you for coming into the studio today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I actually just came here via the Bedford station on the L, and you you happen to have a mural there. You're part of my commute. Oh, thanks. Uh, Yeah, it was quite an honor to have that put up in that stop especially because it was actually the first place i stayed in new york when i moved here. oh yeah yeah well it makes me think you know you're part of my commute you've had this tremendously successful career i think your style is pretty immediately recognizable graphically but you've worked across a ton of different media so i guess for people listening how would you describe what you do like what's the common thread that holds it all together whenever i meet relatives that don't know what i've done i just say that i do figurative surreal work (laughs) and then that way kind of covers it all sure well i mean how do they and and they're like kind of nod and smile (laughs) (laughs) i mean but i guess the reason i ask is because you work across so many media like what's the thing that translates across so many things during art school i always went from film to drawing to painting to sculptures and so I always enjoyed switching it up. Drawing was always the first thing, though. Like, that's what I started that's out That's the doing. foundation. Yeah, the foundation for it all. Sometimes I just need to get out of my comfort zone. And yeah, I just like to switch it up sometimes and just keep it, keep it fresh. <laughs> Are there particular artists that in art school you particularly look to? Uh, yeah, I was really big into William Blake and the Dada as Marcel Duchamp. The other Marcel. Yeah, the other Marcel. <laughs> I actually got into him because of the name. <laughs> really? <laughs> I saw it as a little kid and pulled out his book. I never knew anyone named Marcel, and so I pulled it out and kind of was just fascinated by it. We're talking today about this performance you're working on, and I was looking back over your career and thinking about how 
what a big theme collaboration is for you. And you got your start in Winnipeg in the 90s in a collective, the Royal Art Lodge. Yeah. You did a lot of collaborative work and you've collaborated with a ton of people like Spike Johns and Maurice Sendak and Raymond Pettibon, Kim Gordon, Amy Sedaris, a really eclectic yeah. <laughs> cast of characters in your life. So let's just start there. Like, How do you think about collaboration? I really enjoy it. It's kind of you can be more anonymous in it, especially when I was in the art lodge. So there was like seven of us. So yeah, maybe, you could maybe just say, actually I, I brought it up, but maybe just say yeah. a little bit about the Royal art lodge for people. Yeah, who don't know. It was just a group that we started in art school. It was my little sister, my uncle, and then four other art students. And my uncle was actually a year younger than me. So <laughs> <laughs> my mom had me when she was like 18 or something. And so my grandma, I think was like, maybe 40 when she had my uncle. So we were more like brothers or cousins and we always collaborated on music and we used to do comic books and things like that. What was the methodology of collaboration there? We would try to just start a drawing and then pass it on. And then by the end of the day, they would all be finished. And then we'd go through them and we had this kind of like a suitcase selection of which drawings were good, which were mediocre in which were to be destroyed. <laughs> and we voted on it. Sometimes there was a few. Usually they went into the mediocre ones if they, they were... If it was a split vote. Someone, yeah. yeah. Or if someone really insisted that it shouldn't be destroyed. <laughs> so it was like acting like a band, kind of. Yeah, yeah, definitely like a band. Cause yeah. I, and I just say that because you were also a music guy. You were yeah. in a ton of different We were bands all in bands back together in, in, uh, in each other's bands. I understand bands of all kinds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You were talking about working across media is kind of shaking you out of yourself. And yeah. it's sort of the same with collaboration, huh? It's like yeah. a way to open up new energy, get new ideas into the mix. Yeah, because you could really experiment. Your ego disappears, basically, when you're collaborating in some ways, because you, you have to let in everyone else's as well. So kind of is this blend, unless you're more of the competitive type, <laughs> which I never really was. So we're talking about To Live on the Moon for Lorca, your commission for Performa, the performance art biennial. So what was their ask of you? How yeah. does a Performa commission come together? They just approached me last year. I've been to a few of the performances, so I was honored to be part of it. I've been asked by the Lorca Foundation maybe 10 years ago if I'd be interested in working on this short screenplay that Lorca had written called Trip to the Moon. And I had always had it in the back of my mind to do it, but I was just always too busy. And so I thought this was the perfect mix to... Did they just come to you with the screenplay saying, we think you'd be interested in this? Yeah, I must have quoted some Lorca work or something in one of my drawings. I love Lorca's poems, and so I think I must have had something in there. Because I had a few shows in Spain, and the great niece of Lorca, she had seen those shows. And then I met her in Mexico City at an art fair. And she really liked one of the pieces that I did. And she approached me with this Lurka project. So you had the text, the idea to do something with this Lurka text yeah. that may or may not have been a performance. And then yeah. the performer asked you if you had a performance in you. And then yeah. that's the origin of this project? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mentioned that I had this screenplay to do. And uh, I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to bring it to life and... I also wanted to do a performance element to the film. So I thought that would be a good way to have like a live soundtrack. And then some of the performers that are in the film can also come to life and see them do some of their dancing and their acting. <laughs> yeah, it's really ambitious sounding. It's described as your first evening length performance. And it's got a performance component, a music component and a film component. Like maybe just walk people through what you're expecting to happen. Oh, yeah. So... When you enter the space, hopefully it has some sort of atmosphere. We're trying to make it look kind of like the same world that the film is going to be as well. So there's elements from some of the props from the film are in there. And then we're covering... The film you've staged. Yeah, the film is staged. And then the seats will also be covered with like polka dots because some of the main characters wear these hooded polka dot outfits. And what else is there? There's a giant moon <laughs> that moves and talks. Or am I giving away things? Or well, maybe, you, you, I guess yeah, it's fine. I mean, you can, you're spoiling, <laughs> you're spoiling fine. your I'm spoiling own, my own uh, thing. play. But, uh. <laughs> and then in the end. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's an interactive element to it all. 
what are the big challenges of putting together something like this? I mean, it's different than the way you normally work, although you've done films before. Yeah. Uh, This one's a little easier because I actually had a production person with me because of having Performa work with me. Before, when I've done films, it's me trying to basically rounding up everyone is the hardest part, especially in New York. Everyone's so busy. And so it was a lot easier than some of the other projects I had done that were film. The main thing that was hard, I found out when I was originally approached by the Lorca Foundation, they said that the film had never been made, but I found a Catalonian artist that made the film. Oh, really? (laughs) Three days before I was about to shoot. So I changed the whole film and rewrote it and made it my film instead of the screenplay. Oh, that's fascinating. So someone had taken the same text and done and, their and version. And done their version, version. yeah. So we wanted to make something that so was like a little bit like, more your own? Like, yeah, because I thought if I was the first person to do it, I don't mind doing someone else's film. But I thought if I'm not, I might as well do something that I have a little more control over it than... I guess that's what you call a negative inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you about inspiration. And it kind of came out as a fever dream, too, because I was really kind of like upset about it and went to sleep and then kind of woke up with all these ideas and in the middle of the night and just wrote them all down and then tried to tie it into, cause it still connects with a trip to the moon. Like if you read that screenplay, it's almost like a sequel or a rewrite <laughs> or something. Yours is. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you if there were any positive inspirations. Are there other performance oh, yeah. artworks you're looking to or besides the Lorca text? The Lorca text. I mean, just working with the choreographer, Vanessa Walters, like she came up with some really great, dances just based on like our temp music and so i'm always amazed what she can come up with and we had uh special effects there's a head that blows up <laughs> but um yeah working with the special effects people with the head blowing up it was quite fun we made like a plaster cast of this giant mask i had made out of plaster or well, was paper mache but plaster first and then we dropped a, a watermelon painted like a moon onto this giant head and it was filled with spaghetti and chocolate sauce and inside of condoms and when it hit the plastic cast head it, it blew up so perfectly <laughs> and we only had one take and we only had one head and everything so it was kind of you only had yeah. one head <laughs> Well, it sounds very, uh, you know, carnivalesque. I mean, yeah, y- yeah. Your, your, your work, you've worked in costumes before, and there is a kind of a carnival, surrealist, uh, macabre carnival vibe yeah. to what you do. Yeah, there was a lot of costumes involved in this. I had a really great collaborator for that, too. She goes under Christian Joy. She makes, like, costumes for Karen O of the Yeah Yeahs and a bunch of other bands, too. Cool. Yeah. A question I have about doing this kind of work for Performa is they tend to get artists who work in a lot of other media to do performance art. And it's a specific discipline, performance, a specific medium of its own. It's a little different than theater, too, or other kinds of performance. So I just wondered, do you have a theory of performance art? Or how do you think about the idea of a performance artwork? Yeah, it was actually really nice to actually do a performance because I was working on a lot of large scale drawings and I was kind of wanting to do something that would be more of the moment. You had to be there to see it type of thing. So almost like being a musician back in the day. <laughs> and Like uh, live drawings or? Oh, no, no. I was just doing drawings for shows. And so the performance element of just having it be more of the moment of actually coming to the event and seeing it was really interesting to me. So right, I like right, that, so part that of the show, of the decor of the show, yeah. like it was a show element. I like that whole idea and that it's, you know, you, you had to be there <laughs> kind of idea. But I guess there is a film element to it. So I guess it will live on after in some way. It has a product that enters yeah. the record, you know. Yeah. There's a part when you're there and then yeah. there's the part that lives on. Yeah. I guess you still had to be there to see the yeah. exploding head. Um, <laughs> Um, I've held back about getting into the Lorca because I feel like there's so much to say about it. And I think it's a really interesting material. Yeah. After changing the film from Trip to the Moon to my version, To Live on the Moon, I actually added a lot of Lorca's biography into it. So there's his assassination or his murder by the Spanish nationalists. And then at the end, he gets like resurrected, I guess, or reincarnated as the moon. 
his film was actually pretty tragic. It was almost more of a revenge film. See, yeah. he made it after reading the script that... Well, he never actually made it. He didn't finish it. No, no, uh, he just script. wrote the screenplay. Yeah, I mean, maybe we yeah. should describe what this is, because A Trip to the Moon is this really unique document. It's like a, a surrealist screenplay is, I guess, how I'd call it. Yeah, he wrote it after reading... Boonwell and uh, Salvador Dali's film. Um, is it Shen and Alou? Un Shen and Alou, yeah. And there's a character in there that he thought they were kind of making fun of him in it. So he made his revenge film, <laughs> which I uh, kind of like that whole idea. There's a scene where this couple that draw a mustache on this dead body, and it's a Salvador Dali mustache. Right, and then they right. start making out over top of him. And For that's, I kind of think it's <laughs> has that sort of revenge element for people who haven't read this text it's relatively short it's 70 some bullet pointed sort of surrealist vignettes in description yeah. so I'll, I'll give people a sense like it it says like number one the first scene white bed against a gray wall a dance of the numbers 13 and 22 appears on the bedclothes from two they begin to multiply until they cover the bed like minute ants two an invisible hand pulls off the bedclothes three Big feet run quickly, wearing extravagant black and white lozenge pattern socks, and yeah. so on like that. I mean, it's like they're totally kind of odd little yeah. atoms of thought. Yeah. With mine, I kind of almost took away the more randomness of it and tried to turn it into a story. So those numbers are in the film, and then there's the ants that appear in there as well. And I don't think the bed appears, but... <laughs> what do you do with the numbers? Yeah. What do the numbers mean? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the numbers mean. In my version, there's like a Last Supper type scenario and this pope or a priest slaps it on the head of this kid. There's a swimsuit on, which is another scene in the film, which is kind of a terrible scene in there. Cause it's like a, basically like a priest and a young boy yeah. <laughs> listing scene. So in It's this an edgy line, text. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a hard edgy, text. Yeah. It's like surrealist in the strong There's a lot sense. of animals being strangled in there too. Yeah. So it's of its time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if people yeah. know Chan Nandalu with the <laughs> yeah, famous, exactly. uh, you know, razor blade across the eye. Yeah. It's, and the dead it's donkey. channeling <laughs> that. It's yeah. channeling that energy. <laughs> that was one good thing about changing the script, actually, because I could kind of work around the situations. So the scene with the priest and the swimsuit kid actually almost happens, but that's where it becomes a revenge fantasy instead, where the priest's head explodes. <laughs> right. You already kind of touched on this, but yeah, you said that you have a long time connection to Garcia Lorca, who's yeah. this really important Spanish surrealist, part of the classic generation with Buñuel and Dali. What was your exposure to him? What's your connection uh, to him? I, I was big into Leonard Cohen, just probably coming from Canada. And I always heard him reference Lorca. And so I got into Lorca. Sure. Yeah. Take this there. waltz, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And one of my all time favorite songs, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> And so basically I just read his poetry. I didn't really get into his theater pieces so much or his plays. Later on I got into them and they were really beautiful. There's some really nicely adapted films of them too. They're all in Spanish, which is nice. I mean, he seems to have a significance as an artist, but then also his personal story is part of this. Like you've taken yeah. this surrealist screenplay given it life, but then it's not an adaptation of A Trip to the Moon. It's to live on the moon for Lorca. And like you said before, you do kind of tell his story, which is tragic. He died, he's executed by fascists in Spain seven years after he wrote that piece. Yeah, and it was actually lost till 1989 or something like that. And it was found in a drawer of this filmmaker in Mexico after... This filmmaker had passed away. His widow found his desk drawer. And then I think it was included in the complete works of his in like 94 or something like that. And so I have so two other thoughts about him and you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, let, me, let me throw them at you. One is there's some shared symbols, right? I mean, like you have this long standing vocabulary of symbols, including moon yeah. and uh, <laughs> animals and uh, kind of harlequin figures, all of which feature in this. So did that feel like eerie when you read it? or? Yeah. Uh, I don't know which one came first because I, I was reading Lorca's work before I got obsessed with the moon. And then also, I guess I always had harlequins in there. But uh, I almost feel like it was a slight influence from Lorca that the whole moon obsession <laughs> came to you, yeah. in, into your work. Yeah. Do you think it means the same Pardon? thing? No, because I really got it more into it when I was traveling in Morocco and was up in the mountains over there. And it just felt like I was so close to it. 
And then later when the pandemic happened, my old family and I, we moved to the country and just kind of, my son really got into astrology and I guess it's Lorca and my son that got me into the moon. <laughs> Cause I feel like in his, the moon might suggest death, right? A trip to the moon is like yeah. a trip to the great beyond. Yeah. You're almost trying to resurrect him, right? Yeah. Well, he becomes the moon. <laughs> He's okay. the man on the moon, I guess, or the moon in general. So. Yeah, I feel like you're almost trying to like yeah. give us a happy. Yeah, happy I, I, I was basically trying to give yeah a happy ending to everyone's sad situation in his film and himself. Mine's well, the Hollywood version. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I, I guess this is like the French. <laughs> I wanted to ask you time. about surrealism because uh, yeah, he's drawing on Dali and Buñuel, and that work, Unchain and Dalu, you know, really is an assault on the viewer. I mean, it literally, yeah. they cut open yeah. an eye in front of you, and. This is kind of classic surrealist energy around, you know, surfacing your unspoken desires and repressed taboos and so on, kind of trying to shock the viewer. And yeah, like the very first thing you said, you draw on figurative surrealism. But I mean, you think that's possible to shock people with images like that? Or No, I think I learned that from art school. Coming out of art school, that's all anyone was trying to do was shock everyone else. And it was almost like the most boring thing you could do. I don't know if you can shock anyone anymore and think of it as an artwork. But I appreciate the surrealists and just their more randomness. And I know that, especially like the Dadaists, there was more of a reaction from like World War One and just the terrible things that were happening out of actual well, yeah, conscious what, thought. What, uh, <laughs> you know, what uh, rationality had done? It had led to yeah. this <laughs> tremendous carnage and, you know, so people thought let's yeah. let's try a rationality <laughs> yeah. for a little while let's get rid of this <laughs> <laughs> um but then you know our world now feels so yeah. irrational and random that i yeah. feel it's hard to yeah kind of access <laughs> those things in a kind of liberation sense well yeah in some sense there's a rational thought to it for me this film and performance but i think to someone else you would really there's so many inside jokes, just references to also Lorca's work that you would need like a novel to probably piece it all together. <laughs> Should I tell you the second thing I think oh, yeah. that, about you and Lorca? <laughs> yes. Well, um, you're both, uh, you're Canadian, making your life in New York. He was a Spaniard uh, living like of New York and trying to make sense of that experience through symbols and art. Yeah. And actually he wrote Trip to the Moon when he lived in New York. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I think he was living in Harlem at that time. Yeah, so it's a I very Spanish yeah. depiction of New York. You know, it's just yeah. full of Andalusian <laughs> vibes. Yeah. You know, but it's nevertheless, you know, it's about the experience of kind of trying yeah. to make sense of something. There's this strange energy in New York when you come here, and I felt like when I lived in Winnipeg, like I had a lot of time to work on pieces, and I worked at a slower pace. But when you come here, the speed of everything is so much faster, and I feel that you do progress a lot faster here. You do just so much more in one day than you could possibly do in like a week in some other place. Well, at least Winnipeg. <laughs> not, not to bad about that, but... <laughs> yeah, it's like that bullet-pointed tempo of the screenplay, you know, like one, yeah. two, three. Just, yeah, like it does just have that. Images <laughs> hitting you one after another. Yeah. So I guess final question, is there a message of to live on the moon for Lorca or is there something you want people yeah. to come away from it with? It's a hopeful movie, actually, because it's a lot of sinister events that end up becoming hopeful in the end. <laughs> so, and then I also wanted people to come out and just want to explore more of Lorca's work and maybe check out the original screenplay as well. And he has so many amazing poems. Get his complete works. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I couldn't agree more with that, and I can't wait to see the show. So thank you so much for talking to me, Marcel. Uh, thank you for thank coming you. in. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you've heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, please take a moment to rate and review us. It helps other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening. See you next week.